Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. The House is continuing its controversial January 6th investigation, now trying to serve four members of the former president's administration with subpoenas. That is, if they can actually find them all. Former President Trump, however, is reportedly directing his former aides to defy the subpoenas, according to a new report out today from The Guardian. But will it even matter? Can Congress actually force these people to testify before the committee? And maybe the most important question, will this just drag out past the 2022 elections? The four subpoenas have been issued to some big names in the former president's world, including former chief of staff Mark Meadows, former chief strategist Steve Bannon, and key aides Cash Patel and Dan Scavino. Now, according to a new report from CNN, the House Select Committee can't even find Scavino to physically serve the subpoena more than a week after issuing it, which is ironic because he has been serving as Trump's social media guru, and in that capacity, he's hardly kept a low profile. Eventually, Scavino will be tracked down, and then the real battle will begin. All four aides expected to argue that their conversations with the former president are protected based on executive privilege. Former President Trump has said as much in a statement on August 25th. He said, this partisan exercise is being performed at the expense of longstanding legal principles of privilege. Executive privilege will be defended, not just on behalf of my administration and the patriots who work beside me, but on behalf of the office of the president of the United States and the future of our nation. But deciding what ought to be considered privilege, at least when it comes to documents, is now in the hands of the current executive and his Department of Justice, because they have all the documents. In a letter sent uh, by the Associate Deputy Attorney General to a number of former Justice Department employees who served during the Trump administration, the current DOJ spelled out their reasoning for rejecting the privilege. Quote, Congress has articulated compelling legislative interests in the matter being investigated. It is the executive branch's view that this presents an exceptional situation in which the congressional need for information outweighs the executive branch's interest in maintaining the confidentiality. The department has consulted with the White House counsel. The counsel's office conveyed to the department that President Biden has decided it would not be appropriate to assert executive privilege. Now, another point against the aides is the argument that on January 6th, President Trump wasn't acting in his role as commander in chief, but they would argue rather as a candidate and a private citizen. Remember, the former president called on outside attorneys to argue his case. If he'd been acting in his official capacity, then theoretically he ought to have had the White House counsel representing him. While the legal argument may be weak, the practicalities of it are on the former president's side. The Trump officials will almost certainly go to court to fight a denial of executive privilege. And that can take time. I'm betting the Trump officials can run out the clock, even just to the 2022 elections when Republicans could take back the majority. I'd expect the January 6th committee made up of Democrats and two Republicans at odds with Trump would be disbanded and Congress would have to the difficulty that this is an issue they've had before. 2007, Democratic Congressman John Conyers tried to compel testimony from former White House counsel Harriet Myers, who claimed executive privilege. They sued Myers to force her to testify and they won. You know how long it took? About a year. And there was also a ruling at that time was unclear on whether she would have even had to actually answer the questions when she appeared. So where does this leave us? Well, I needed someone who actually knows this stuff way better than I do. Bradley Moss. He's an attorney specializing in cases dealing with national security issues. He's been involved with a host of prominent cases over the years. Great to have you here. Thanks a lot for coming on the show. Appreciate it. So we Absolutely. got a lot of a lot of issues to tackle here. First, let me ask you about the practicalities of it. We'll get back to the legal issues, but the legal issues almost don't matter. If it's a practical matter, this is just going to be stretched out. Do you agree with me that this is likely going to take something like a year or more to fight this in the courts? If it's strictly a civil matter, yes, you're correct in that in that context. The, you know, the courts themselves are backed up anyways out here in the D.C. area, and in particular with this kind of issue, which would have weighty matters of executive privilege and separation of powers concerns, there would be almost certainly any number of motions that come up, and it would certainly take at least six to nine months just to get an initial ruling. So if this is strictly a civil matter, if this is trying to quash a subpoena, or if this is Congress suing to compel just the mere testimony, 
money, you're looking at a year minimum. What we don't know is whether or not DOJ will get involved on any criminal referrals for contempt of Congress. That is possibly the only real leverage the committee has, in my view. Well, but but when you say uh, for a criminal case for contempt of Congress, you know, their argument would be, wait a sec, you, you know, you can't hold us in contempt yet. We're just exercising our rights to take this through the courts. And as a result, I'd be very surprised if DOJ would say we're going to hold these people in contempt before they're even allowed to exercise their rights and arguments in court. No. If the, if these individuals decide to sue to quash the subpoena, if they simply yes. fail to show up, which oh, we're now right. see what happens, you know, right, see what happens tomorrow when it comes to documents in the 15th, which is when they're supposed to show up for depositions. If they just don't show up and straight up ignore it, that's where I think there might be a criminal element. If they do what would be legally responsible for them, which is to, to mm -hmm. file a lawsuit to quash the subpoena, then you've got a whole different situation. That's where it opens up some areas of potential criminal inquiry that the committee can use for leverage. So what, we, what we're waiting on right now is to see what really happens tomorrow and what kind of legal game these four individuals, particularly Dan Scavino, who no one can find apparently, uh, will play. Right. So just to be clear, and I think it's a really important point there, which is what they better do is challenge this in court. What they better not do is just ignore it, because if they ignore it, as you point out, then they could be facing criminal contempt. Then you can literally can force them. You can put them in jail uh, if they don't agree. And I think that that's an important distinction. Real quick, what do you make of the strength of their legal argument with regard to executive privilege here? Yeah, this is going to be interesting if we actually get to evaluate the merits, because you, know, you noted a bit in the um, run up to the segment, the courts have very rarely gotten into the details and substantive issues here with respect to whether or not a congressional subpoena could, could override the invocation of executive privilege. So even if we assume President Biden wouldn't overrule any invocation done by former President Trump, there's no real case law that gives us great insight. There is the Harriet Myers case you mentioned, but again, we never knew what was going to happen if she came to testify. And there was the Eric Holder situation during the end of the Obama years, but that was only with respect to documents. That wasn't testimony. So what's going to happen here, even if these guys have to show up to give depositions, we don't know. And the litigation would be fascinating for constitutional scholars, but no one truly knows what the courts would rule on it. Yeah. All right, so we've got uh, some big question marks out there, but the, the next phase of this is going to be to see whether they actually challenge this in court or if they just try and blow it off. Um, and there could be very different outcomes depending on what they do. Bradley Moss, great to have you on the show. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Never problem. Still to come tonight, it started with a guy running a red light and ended with an officer shot. See more of the explosive video still ahead. Welcome back. Governors and lieutenant governors don't always agree on everything. In fact, in many states, they can be from different parties. But imagine a situation where the governor leaves the state and the lieutenant governor decides to immediately take over and try to do a lot of stuff the governor won't like while he's gone. Sounds like a movie script, except it's actually happening in the state of Idaho. The state's number two executive, Lieutenant Governor Janet McGeechan, hijacked power as soon as the governor, Brad Little, left for a trip to the border this week. Now, while Little was in Texas meeting with nine other Republican governors over concerns on how President Biden is handling border security, Lieutenant Governor McGeechan, also a Republican, signed an executive order banning vaccine passports and mandatory COVID testing in schools. She even tried to mobilize the Idaho National Guard to the border. The head of Idaho's National Guard rejected the lieutenant governor's request. Governor Little responding today, seemingly unconcerned that his edicts have been formally overturned. We're working on it. We'll, we'll take care of it. So, uh, this is not my first rodeo on this event, uh, uh, but we'll, we'll take care of it when we get back. The governor tweeting earlier, I'm in Texas and performing my duties as the duly elected governor of Idaho, and I have not authorized the lieutenant governor to act on my behalf. And those of you asking, no, Governor Little did not select McEachin to be his running mate. And Idaho races for governor and lieutenant governor are run separately. And get this, this isn't even the first time that McEachin's gone rogue. 
Back in May, while Governor Little was at a Republican conference in Tennessee, McGeechan issued an executive order prohibiting mask mandates. Look, her motives seem clear. It's an eye on the state's governor mansion. She's trying to show the people of Idaho that she's willing to go much further on some hot button issues than the Republican governor now. Over time, arrogant politicians have allowed Idaho to lose the principles that made Idaho great. They have locked down our businesses and forced us to abide by their preferences about our health. It's time to take back our state and restore traditional conservative values in Idaho. It's time to make Idaho free again. Okay, so can the lieutenant governor in Idaho take executive actions when the governor is out of the state? Well, sort of. Idaho's constitution says that absence from the state or inability to discharge the powers and duties of his office are grounds for governor's powers, including executive actions, to, quote, devolve upon the lieutenant governor. Now, obviously, this was not the intent. It also talks about death and resignation, etc. Constitution was ratified in 1889 when leaving the state was a big deal. But in theory, the lieutenant governor has the power to issue executive orders when the governor is out of the state. When she tried these shenanigans before, the state's deputy attorney general wrote a legal letter declaring the lieutenant governor did not have the power to change state law or to determine public health policy and that she was encroaching on the authority of local school districts. You know, those same issues apply here. But it sounds like if she can figure out the right issue and do it in the right way until there's a court ruling on this, She'll continue to try to play some games with the people of Idaho. Joining me now is Sally Krutzig. She's a reporter for the Idaho Statesman. Sally, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. All right, so how are people in Idaho responding to this? Meaning, are they saying this is great? Are they ready to implement her orders, even though it seems like they may just be for a day or two? I think you have the full range of reactions. You know, as you said, uh, McGeehan was elected by the people. She has supporters. Um, Idaho is a state with high vaccine hesitancy rates. Not everyone is upset about this surprise executive order. At the same time, you have, uh, you know, people from her own party, Republican leaders, calling her out on social media, calling her out in statements, saying this is a step too far. But I mean, putting aside the policy issues, right, about the debates over, you know, the mandates and this and that, I mean, this seems nuts, right? The idea that the governor leaves the state and suddenly it's like the lieutenant governor like runs into his house and says, OK, now I've got my chance. I'm going to go and issue all these orders. I mean, are any I guess one of the questions, are any of these orders actually taking effect? I mean, we know the National Guard already said no to going down to the border. Are any of these orders being implemented or is everyone just sort of like, oh, yeah, she's at it again. Let's just wait till dad comes home and we'll deal with this. Well, the interesting thing is these executive orders are about things that are not even in place in Idaho. Um, you know, her first one in May banned statewide mask mandates. We did not have a statewide mask mandate. <laughs> you know, she recently uh ex this was an expansion of an order to ban vaccine passports there are no va vaccine passports in idaho uh currently you know state agencies are not requiring proof of covid vaccination to access services these are not things that are happening so this is you know the word grandstanding has been used so do you think though you mentioned that she's got a lot of supporters i mean look she's making a political calculation here that it's going to help her um what is the thinking from the politicos inside of Idaho? Does these sort of, you know, is this sort of shenanigans going to help her? I think it is a bold way to say this is what I'm about and this is how I want to do things differently than, you know, Governor Little is doing right now. Um, Governor yeah. Little has not announced whether he's going to run, um, but there's speculation he could. And so in that case, I think she's trying to show, you know, this is what he's doing and this is what I would do if you elected me instead. Yeah, see, I'm a rules guy. I'm a law and order guy. I like people to follow the way things are supposed to happen. And I, I typically don't like it when people 
sort of decide to sort of take the, the law into their own hands. But on this one, with the Idaho Constitution, there is some ambiguity, and the Idaho Supreme Court has not officially ruled on it, right? Right. There hasn't really been a need before. Normally, when the governor leaves and the lieutenant governor becomes acting governor, it's a name only. They get to park in the governor's parking spot that day. Uh, but, you know, McGeehan <laughs> taking that a step farther has definitely raised issues on whether this should still be part of our laws. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if when he gets back, that parking spot has new fresh paint over that spot with somebody else's name on it. Um, all right, Sally, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, forget the debate between Fox versus CNN and MSNBC. A new report says the most radical cable news channel of all is in bed with a telecom giant. Oh, a telecom giant that just happens to also own CNN. Coming up. What if I told you that the same company that owns CNN has also been keeping a propaganda network on the air? I know, I know. Those of you who don't like CNN are going to say, they already do with CNN. I got it. But this is about One America News Network, OWN, a fringe, largely conspiratorial network that continues to push baseless conspiracies about the 2020 election and COVID, among other topics. A jaw-dropping report from Reuters today uncovered a shocking truth about OWN. The company is almost entirely funded thanks to contracts with AT&T. Yes, AT&T, owner of CNN parent company Warner Media has been bankrolling Donald Trump's favorite news channel, responsible for moments like these. So this is a pretty like strong like metal key hook. And I put it right here, and it just sort of hangs, if you can see. And my arm is There, your arm's straight down right now, I see it. Now it fell off, but it still hung for a bit, and the other one didn't. What are the consequences for traitors who meddled with our sacred democratic process and tried to steal power by taking away the voices of the American people. What happens to them? Well, in the past, America had a very good solution for dealing with such traitors. Execution. Do you consider the term Chinese food racist because no. it's food that originates in China or it has Chinese No, I don't think it's you racist. Know, I don't think it's racist at all. I mean, there is some level of parody, except it's not a joke. Um, and by the way, the first um, clip there was of a woman trying to show what happened to her after she got the COVID vaccine. Now, according to court records and depositions unearthed by Reuters, own founder Robert Herring Sr. says that he decided to launch uh, this propaganda machine after a meeting with Dallas-based telecom giant AT&T, quote, they told us they wanted a conservative network. They only had one, which was Fox News, and they had seven others on the other side. When they said that, I jumped to it and built one. Well, no, that sounds like a smart business to me. But in the years that followed, Owen went from conservative to off the rails with AT&T as the primary source of money for the company. According to sworn testimony from an accountant, AT&T and its subsidiaries like satellite broadcaster DirecTV were responsible for 90% of OAN's revenue. According to an OAN accountant, without the direct TV contract, OAN's value would be, quote, zero. In a statement to News Nation, an AT&T spokesperson said that direct TV airs many news channels that offer a variety of viewpoints, but it does not dictate or control programming on those channels. OK, but to call OAN news is a stretch at best. It's not a conservative network like Fox News or even Newsmax. It's really almost an overt propaganda tool. OAN allowed two reporters to raise over $600,000 to help fund that private review of the presidential vote in Arizona, despite Republican officials insisting that Biden won the state. And Reuters reports that they did so with the network's blessing. One of them, Christina Bob, even worked part-time for the Trump recount legal team. Now, OAN made its reputation in the industry by pe peddling the most extreme 2020 election conspiracies. They're now being sued for defamation, by Smartmatic and Dominion Voting for upwards of $1.6 billion. Joining me now is Tara Setmeyer, resident scholar at the University of Virginia Center for Politics, senior advisor 
for the Lincoln Project, a longtime uh, conservative advisor. Tara, I was stunned when I saw this only because AT&T has been sort of going out of its way to claim, you know, uh, we're going to be cutting contributions to candidates that objected to the election results, et cetera. And now it turns out that they've been funding OAN. Well, thanks for having me, Dan. And uh, not quite with AT&T. Uh, they try to spin the fact that they didn't renege on their initial pledge not to support the 147 Republicans who objected to certifying the election on January 6th, even after the violent insurrection. Um, they did renege on that. They were they, continuing to give political contributions in a roundabout way, giving it to the NRCC or the NRSC, the, the bigger PACs, like the um, saying that it's not individuals, we're going to the bigger PACs, and they promised us it's not going to go to any of the objectors. Right. Well, you know, I didn't just fall off the political turnip truck yesterday. Um, AT&T, I'm not surprised that they continue to um, take, recognize that there was uh, some, a, a revenue opportunity here with OANN, yeah. despite the fact that OANN has been a uh, propaganda channel of the most irresponsible ilk. How many of the people who went and stormed our capital and who are don't believe in our institutions anymore, who are you know, putting out, perpetuating this big lie by Donald Trump, are watchers of OANN. It is absolute corporate irresponsibility at its worst, worst putting so, profits over our democracy. And let, AT&T let, let should be ashamed this. of themselves for funding right, let, this. Let me ask you this. You, you used to work at CNN, right? I have mm -hmm. got to believe that everyone at CNN is unhappy about this. Now, yeah. I think that if if AT and T were not selling um, Warner Media to another company right now, there would be, you know, an internal revolt uh, that might actually lead to to this changing. But it sounds like AT and T is going to stick by its position, which is: look, we're not directly funding them; um, they're on a, a a channel that that. Uh, for a business that we now only own 70% of, or whatever the case may be. They know exactly what they're doing. They have the ability, they still own 70%, right? They're shareholders, there's a board of directors. These people need to be shamed into doing the right thing. OANN is an existential threat to our democracy and our institutions because they continue to spew Russia level propaganda, and it's brainwashing millions of people in this country to do things that are uh, violent, and against our democracy. And AT&T should be held to account for it. I mean, they all, yeah. that's not the only thing they've done. They, they funded $300,000 worth of, uh, of uh, Texas legislators who supported the abortion ban, the draconian abortion ban going on. You know, they have also, so, they've done a lot of these things and people need to be, they need to be exposed for what they're doing and you just add this to the list. You know, I, I think uh, people who have not watched OAN, who might watch this segment and say, well, you know, it seems like you're singling out a conservative network, et cetera. Um, I, I had some people call into my radio show today when we discussed this issue. Um, and when I said to them, have you actually watched OAN? Yeah. The answer was almost universally no. And there was just this sort of immediate reaction to say, it just seems you know, unfair that we're kind of targeting this network that happens to, to bill itself as a conservative network, but I don't view it as a conservative network. Um, right. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't advocate, in my view, conservative positions or ideals. It advocates conspiracy theories, and there's a difference. Um, and that's why it is very different, and I would never compare it to Fox News. Um, and so I just wanted to on make that levels. very clear. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but on, I, on I just, some I just levels, want, Dan. Well, you know what I, I mean? No, I don't. I, I, I think it's Listen, not. It's simply look. The bottom, it's just, it's not comparable at all to Fox. Well, it's just I, not. Not, well, I would, I would push back only slightly on that. Not maybe, maybe not Fox News, the news division during the day. But if you turn on Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram, the, the ilk that they yeah. spew and the conspiracy theories are not that far off from some of the stuff that you hear on OANN, unfortunately. Well, I, I, and I think that well, Donald look. Trump's support of OANN has pushed Fox News' editorial primetime shows over into Cuckooville well, well, there a little bit to compete one, with them. One of, the, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this show is because I believe that Fox has been pulled to the right by networks like Newsmax um, and you know pulled 
pretty far, as you point out, in prime time, mm -hmm. and that CNN and MSNBC, I think, have been pulled to the left, and as a result, that there is a kind of a lane in the middle. So to some degree, I agree with you. I just think that the fundamentals of how OWN Fair. does what they do and people working for the Trump campaign, et cetera, oh, make yeah. it different. Anyway, it's Tara, completely unethical, you. completely unethical. And I think the more that we shine right. a light on this, the, the more that corporate responsibility will be a topic of conversation here because AT&T really should be ashamed of themselves for perpetuating this. Thank you for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Coming up. Thank you. An officer down, I'm shot here. by a suspect. The agonizing moments before help arrived, all caught on police body cam. Our Sean Sticks Larkin will join us live to walk us through this unbelievable video up next. U.S. Marshals are looking for a fugitive on the run for more than 20 years now. John Rufo was convicted of a $350 million bank fraud scheme in 1998. The computer salesman from Brooklyn was sentenced to 17 and a half years in prison. But right before he was supposed to start serving his time, he hit the road, went on the run, and now he may have been spotted at a Dodgers game. The feds have released surveillance photos of Rufo stopping at an ATM on the day he was supposed to report to prison in New Jersey. Those are the last known photos of him. That same day, Rufo's rented Ford Taurus was found in a parking lot at JFK Airport in New York. Rufo is one of the Marshall's 15 most wanted fugitives. Because Rufo had strong international ties and Marshalls think he could be living overseas, the wanted poster has been translated into seven languages. But get this, Rufo may have been spotted right here in the U.S. His cousin, who lives in New Hampshire, was watching the Boston Red Sox play the Los Angeles Dodgers on TV in 2016. Good seats, too. He saw a guy who resembled Rufo sitting right behind home plate at Dodger Stadium. I mean, they're expensive tickets. The guy's got money. Investigators say someone else bought the ticket and gave it away. So the marshals have not been able to confirm if that guy is actually Rufo. This is a picture of the man at the game next to an age progression photo of Rufo from the U.S. Marshals. And so the manhunt continues. With me now is Judd Burstein, who represented Rufo after his arrest. Thank you so much for taking the time. We appreciate it. Okay. All right, so to get, give us a little history here. How did he get out on bail in the first place, knowing that he are bond, that he had a potential to be a flight risk? Well, he was on bail right from the start with a monitor I, when I got him out of um, prison at the beginning of the case. And he showed up for every court appearance. And when I negotiated his plea deal, one of the things I required was, was that he would have the right to a direct surrender, which means that instead of them hauling him off into prison after he's sentenced, he gets to directly surrender to the institution. And the reason why I would do that was if you get brought into a prison after a federal conviction, you can spend two weeks on a bus going back around the country until you get to your designated institution. There was nothing very and were you, unusual about that. Were you, I assume you were stunned when he fled? Yeah, of course I was. I was, I was actually, yeah. um, I was outraged because I had managed to get him out on bail for a fraction of the amount that they wanted because he was putting up his mother's and I believe his aunt's house and uh, a cousin's house. And I argued to the prosecutors that that was better than a $20 million bond because nobody runs off and leaves their mother and their wife and their aunt homeless. Um, so I was shocked and also pretty outraged that, that it happened. And is that what happened? Did they all lose yes. their homes because of this? They, they, they were all thrown out of their homes. It's wow. a tragedy. And so, I mean, I, I find it amazing that, you know, this happened in 1998. We've got all sorts of technological advances now um, in terms of facial recognition, et cetera, um, that they haven't been able to find him up to this point. Aren't you surprised? Well, I mean, a guy who can um, go into, uh, you know, a consortium of banks and 
tell them that uh, we're doing a deal for a secret government project involving Philip Morris, and it's so secret, you need to lend us $350 million, and we can't even give you the serial numbers on the uh, you know, on the computers that, that we're buying, that you're supposedly secured by, if a guy who can accomplish that and get $350 million from a bank, I suspect that running away and be keeping, uh, you know, and not being caught is a lot easier for him. I'm, I'm just about out of time here. Do you think the guy in the, uh, at the Dodgers game is him? No. He doesn't All look right. like him. He was a much. He was a. Uh, he, he had. He was much smaller in stature. I mean, unless he's been working out at the gym every day since he left in 1998, that's not him. All right. So you know, why did we do this segment at all? I mean, you know, shucks. You John got me. I didn't Thank you. It's, it's a fascinating <laughs> case, but not because the guy's running off. Because that's well, not him, and I don't think he's going to be found. All right, Judd Burstein, it thank you. It struck me as a, appreciate as a silly it. thing to do, but you asked me, so I said, okay. We did. We, appre we appreciate it. Look, there's a big podcast that's been suggesting that, that, that there's a big reveal here, and uh, maybe there's not. We're coming right back. Judd, thanks so much. Bless you. Time for our police cam segment showing you the dangers police officers face every day. I want to warn you, tonight's video may be difficult for some to watch. It starts after a suspect in Wisconsin speeds away from cops at a traffic stop. Show me your ass! Stay in the car! Show me your ass! Don't move! Don't Show move! Don't move! Show me your ass right now! We had a crash at 27, hit another vehicle. Put the hands up now! Put the hands up! Get more squads here now. Back up! We're in pursuit! We know! Back up! Put your hands up now! Let me see that right hand! Shots fired! Shots fired! Shots fired! Shots fired! I'm hit! I'm hit! Show me your He's running. Hi. No, I'm hit. Hit? Yeah, give me. Hit. Where? Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Hit my leg. This happened near Milwaukee in August, but the video was released just a few days ago. Police say the suspect, Tyron Lamb, drove through a red light, pulled over, then sped off when another officer arrived on the scene. Lamb tried to drive through a flashing red light, instead smashed into a pickup truck. The police department says officers told Lamb to put his hands up 18 times before he shot one of the officers through his windshield. Lamb then shoots at another officer, takes cover, Lamb's runs, exchanges gunfire with the officer he just shot at point-blank range. The police later found him, and he died in a shootout. The officer miraculously survived. Joining us now to break it down is retired Tulsa Police Lieutenant Sean Stix Larkin. Man, Stix, watching that one, I had to take a couple deep breaths. I, I, I got to admit, that's the first time I've seen the full video. It's just watching it on air right now. Take us through it. Yeah, same thing. You know, this thing popped up on uh, all the police social media that I follow or that I'm involved with pretty quickly. Uh, once it was released, and I was only seeing a short version of it. So what the department put out shows dash cam footage, body cam footage, and it takes you all the way back to how this started and revert back to what we talked about last night. It was a simple traffic stop, um, you know, that had this type of, of ending result when a suspect who was an armed felon engages police officers like this. Um, he rolled through a red uh, flashing light, initial, or I'm sorry, a red stoplight. Um, and then when the officers try to stop him, I think he was actually baiting the officers that far back. Because when you watch this full video, he pulls over, he waits for the officers to get up, then he barely pulls forward. He barely pulls forward. And I think he was actually waiting for an officer at that time to get out of the car and a possible gunfire, or I'm sorry, gun uh, shootout would have happened then. Um, you know, I've been on these type of calls where you hear an officer come out, uh, come on over the radio, shots fired that I've been hit. Um, as an officer that's out on patrol, you feel like you cannot get to that scene fast enough 
um, just knowing what's going on. So, you know, from from a, from a law enforcement perspective, this uh, situation is going to be evaluated. Tactics will be looked at. Um, you know, the other departments will discuss on good things and bad things that could have been done differently on it. You know, what we're seeing right now, this is the uh, a young officer that is putting the tourniquet on the officer that was hit multiple times and most likely saved his life based on everything I've heard about it. You know, you see a witness say something to police just before the officer is shot. Um, that really had the potential to be a real distraction. And, and it actually was. Uh, you know, this this video, there's actually a part where it's there, there's a freeze frame where both officers turn to look back at this pedestrian that has chosen to put themselves uh, in this situation. And what I don't understand, honestly, is how if you see law enforcement officers have their guns out drawn on somebody or something that you want to get involved with that. Um, you know, and, and, and besides this man that's walking around who is the person that, you know, does say something, you've still got people or a person at least in the truck that was struck. You know, so there's another person that's out there potentially injured from the car accident that is also in the line of fire of, uh, you know, what ultimately ended up happening. Yeah, and it, it also just a reminder that, you know, in this kind of situation, you don't have time to, to think about what you got to do next, right? I mean, you know, you, you're, you're not, when you say, hey, let me see your hand, you're actually not thinking the person's actually going to pull out a gun and shoot. And then when it starts happening, you got to just go with your gut and your training. Yeah, you know, and, and that's the thing is typically on at the end of a high speed chase like this, you want to do what's called a felony car stop or a high risk car stop where you're not going to approach the vehicle. You're going to try to give commands from a place of what we call ballistic cover back behind your car and try to draw the suspect back to you. However, when you have one that ends in a collision, the airbags are deployed. You don't know if that person is unconscious in the car because of the accident, if they're severely injured. Um, obviously, like I said, you have an innocent civilian that's now been potentially injured from the accident. So when the gunfire happens, uh, you know, the male officer that's hit, he immediately actually returns fire, goes to the closest point of ballistic cover, which is around that truck. He gets, you know, yeah. himself in a place of, uh, of safety and the suspect actually ends up running right back by him again where the second gun, uh, you know, shootout in, ensues. Yeah. Wow. All right. Sean, thank you for taking us through this. And once again, uh, you know, miraculous that the officer uh, survived. You could hear uh, him uh, pleading for his life there. Sean, thanks yeah, a lot. He was, yes. Great to see you. Thank you, Dan. All right. Uh, coming up, something monumental happened this week. Both the right and left became united against a common enemy, Facebook. But of course, unity is bad for cable news. So they found a different angle. We're bringing it to you tonight's Mediate Moments, coming up next. Before we get to our Mediate Moments, just want to let you know that there's some breaking news, and that is a federal judge has issued a preliminary injunction stopping enforcement of that controversial Texas abortion law, which basically said that if there is an abortion that takes place after six weeks, that individual citizens can report it and potentially get a bounty uh, for reporting it. The district court has put a stop to it, at least for now. And it means that there will be further debate on this in the future. It's an 113 page opinion that has just come through. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but we will and we'll cover it. But now it's time for our Mediate Moments, where we check in on the day's bias buzz and the bull in the world of cable news and beyond. Facebook whistleblower Francis Houghton appeared on 60 Minutes last weekend and revealed damning evidence that the social media giant had ignored just how dangerous the platform was and instead chose astronomical profits. But something miraculous happened. The political world seemed immediately unified in its anger towards Facebook, politicians from both sides laying into the social media giant. Their product is addictive and people on both sides of this dais are concerned about this. It is documented proof that Facebook knows its products can be addictive and toxic to children. Facebook prioritizes profit over the well-being of children and all users. Facebook time and time again has put profit mm -hmm. over people. But the but there was one senator, Democrat Richard Blumenthal, who also encouraged some bipartisan mockery when parading his ignorance on fake Instagram users, also known as 
Finsta with the kids. Finsta is one of your products or services. We're not talking here about Google or Apple. It's Facebook, correct? We don't actually do, do Finsta. Blumenthal found a sympathetic place to clean up his mess at, of course, CNN. There's been a lot of fallout, uh, judgment of you for saying that. What is your response to it? I took a little ribbing online. The internet had a laugh. <clears throat> My kids had a laugh. And I had a laugh. Yeah, it's supposed to be someone asking tough questions and engaging in oversight. Yeah, I guess it's, uh, you can say you had a laugh. Um, but uh, we're just about out of time here, I think. So uh, I'll, I want to continue to let you know about the, um, the ruling that came down in Texas, that this means that for now, that abortion law will not be in effect. Um, and that is one of the, the big issues that has been at, at the question, not just the broad constitutional questions, but what happens now? And so this means that uh, once again, you will see abortion providers in the state of Texas allowed to perform those kinds of abortions that were at issue in this case. Um, and those are the ones that occurred after six weeks. So it's a big ruling. It's a um, important step in the legal process, but it's just a step. It's a preliminary injunction. It does not mean that there has been a final ruling on this matter. That does it for us tonight. News Nation Prime starts right now.